you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm here to uh, talk about resilience patterns with ballerina. So in the first half of the presentation, I will be talking about some of the concepts related to uh, uh, Sorry, uh, in the first half of the presentation, I'll be discussing uh, some of the concepts related to resilience. And later on, I will look at how we can uh, build resilient programs using Ballerina. So, how many of you have built resilient software? Okay, so only few. So let me uh, start with the story. So this story is about a software developer called Bob. Uh, Bob uh, works in the IT department of a popular bank. So one day his manager asked him to develop a mobile banking application. Okay, so this banking application should be capable of uh, showing the uh, recent uh, transaction details as well as the account balances. This bank already got some services which provide these functionality. So, but those services are not exposed to the outside. So those are for internal operations. So if you want to develop a, a mobile application out of those services, it's just a matter of exposing them as APIs and consuming them. Okay? So it looks like a very simple task. Then Bob started to implement this, uh, this uh, application, but he found some issues. So Time to time, these, uh, some of these legacy services give transient uh, failures. Some of these services can only handle a moderate load. So if you expose these services into the rest of the world, they may easily get failed because uh, uh, when they are used internally, only a handful of people are using, at, uh, using those services at a particular time. But if you expose it to the outside, thousands of uh, people are using it at the same time. So there's a high chance of a failure. So, uh, so even though there are failures happening in the service level, in, this, in these legacy services, we can't expose those errors directly back to the client. So you need to handle that gracefully. And so Bob, uh, try to fix those errors uh, in these legacy services, but unfortunately he couldn't do that because those services were built long time ago and nobody knows about how to fix those. So he was in a trouble. So he thought about it a lot and finally he got an idea. So the idea is write a new service, a new resilient service which hide all the issues happening in the backend services and provide us uh, interface to the outside world which provide the 100% availability. So let's uh, find out uh, what resiliency is. Uh, this picture is uh, taken from the most popular Android uh, game, the Angry Bird. So here uh, you can see there's a weapon called a slingshot or a catapult. So in the sling, slingshot can, uh, has a, a, a rubber strip which you can pull it. So once you pull it and release it, the angry bird is getting released to the sky and the, uh, sling, uh, the, the rubber strips of the slingshot come back to the original position. So the ability to come back to the original position or come back to the original form after being uh, affected by some alteration is called resilience. So this is also called as recoverability. So then uh, let's look at what resiliency means in software application. So when we put an application into the production, there can be numerous errors. So the, uh, sometimes part of the application might fail. Sometimes these applications take a long time to respond. And uh, sometimes there can be even a complete failure. So the resilience in software application means the ability to recover from such incident and coming back to a working condition. So now let's look at the relationship between the reliability and resilience. 
IEEE says the reliability is uh, the probability of failure free software operation for a specified period of time in a specified environment. So that simply means 100% stable uh, system operational all the time. So when we are designing software, we are mainly targeting on the reliability aspect. So we do whatever we can do to make the software bug free and reliable. But uh, is that enough? So is that enough to just focus on the reliability aspect? It is not. So let's find out why it is not enough. So today, the, almost all the systems are distributed systems. So uh, we hardly see any system working in an isolated manner. Uh, most systems are connected with different other systems to provide useful functionality. So these distributed systems has uh, various complex uh, interactions. So because of that, uh, these network links are prone to failures. So it's hard to expect a 100% reliable network. So, and also, so when, when we uh, develop an application, we do various things to make it bug free. So we do functional testing and we do load testing or stress testing to figure out the maximum load that a node can handle. And also we do a long running testing to figure out whether there will be issues when the software runs in the production for a long period of time. Uh, failures like uh, CPU spikes, memory leaks that cap can happen when the software runs in the production for a long time. So we do all those tests. But still there can be untested edge cases which may pop up as an incident in the production. And even a simple minor programming mistake can lead to a serious production incident. So uh, by experience, we know that it is hard to predict these failures. So, so in simple terms, it is uh, hard to avoid failures in the production. So that's why we need resilience. So in, uh, an, in resiliency in production, so basically to achieve the resilience in production, we first need to identify whether there are failures are happening. So if the failures are happening in the system and if nobody knows about it, then you can't recover from it. So that's why a silent failure is, a, is not a good thing in production. So we need monitoring. We need monitoring to detect failures and take actions against that. So, uh, so the ultimate goal of uh, having resiliency in production is uh, you, you, the, you have to prevent uh, the upstreams getting affected from the errors happening in the downstream. So those errors has to be handled gracefully at the uh, service level without exposing them to the upstreams. So it's all about achieving uh, availability of a production system. What that means is, when you put some uh, software into the production, you expect that to work. So if that fails time to time, nobody can use it. So if you want to generate a business value out of some software, you need to make it 100% available. There are two things we can do to make it available. Either you have to make it bug free and reliable all the time, or else if those services are failing, you need to minimize the time it takes to recover the service. Okay, So we, by experience, we know that it is hard to expect 100% reliable system. So in that case, what we can do is, we can try to minimize the time it takes to recover from failures. So what does it mean for a user? So in the ideal case, user will experience a 100% availability of the system. So he will see uh, a smooth interface without any failures. But this ideal case is something hard to achieve. So in that case, the, the typical case is user will experience some degradation of the service in the form of uh, maybe a slowness in the system or some intermittent failures. So what does it mean for a developer? 
So as developers, when we are building software, we need to think about these failures. So we can't just rely on those networks. We can't believe that, that those networks will be 100% available and reliable. So when you are designing the software, we need to design the software thinking about those connection issues, slowness of the network, congested networks, various th these uh, issues into the consideration when we are designing the software. To achieve the resiliency, we have some set of patterns. So I'm not going to talk about all of these patterns, but I, I have picked uh, four of them and I'm going to discuss about them. So those are bulkhead, retry, circuit breaker and timeout. So let's look at the bulkhead first. Okay, so uh, when we are designing some software application, we need to identify components of the application that can operate without much interaction of the others. Okay, so if we can identify such different components, if a failure happens in a particular component, the rest of the stuff will still work. So in that case, you, you will get the chance to prevent cascading failures. The cascading failures means if one component fails, as a reaction of that, another one fails. And again, another one fails. So we can prevent that chain of failures if we can design the software in this manner. Okay, so the other advantage is if you can implement the bulkhead pattern, you will get a chance to uh, expose service in different service level agreements. You can give some different levels of service level agreements to your consumers. So I'll be talking about that a uh, little bit more on the later slides. So let me uh, move on to the next pattern. The next pattern is uh, retry. I'm pretty sure that uh, everyone can identify this picture, who is in this picture. So this is uh, Thomas Alva Edison, uh, who invented the light bulb. So while he is trying to implement this light bulb, uh, he has failed several thousands of attempts. But he never gave up. He tried, tried uh, several uh, thousands of attempts and finally he invented the light bulb. So same thing is there in the software. So some of the failures happening in the software applications are transient failures. So those transient failures are not, a, not an uncommon thing. So these uh, failures can recover by itself. So if you see, uh, uh, see such failure, there are three things we can do. The first thing is, if you are sure about that this is something that is not recoverable, you can cancel that, cancel this request, and you can take some other action. You may send to some other party. Okay, so then the next one is retry. So if you think that is uh, something recoverable, then you can try an, uh, another attempt. That may end up with a success, or that may fail too. So you can do another retry, but you can't retry forever as uh, Thomas Alva Edison did. So you have to retry for some time, and then you need to stop uh, it after some degree. So then, uh, the next one is retrying with a delay. So if you are retrying uh, the service uh, invocation immediately after a failure, there's a high chance of uh, getting that fail too. Because, so if a failure happens, that the service might be overloaded or in some kind of a state where it can't handle that request. So if you immediately try it again, then there's a high chance of failing it again. So what we can do is, we can give a graceful time period for service to recover by itself. So that is what we can do with retrying with a delay. So we have a pause between several retries. Okay. Um, so then the next pattern is timeout. So um, time to time some of the services may take uh, a longer time to respond. But your client is expecting the response in a quick time. So let's say the backend takes uh, two minutes to respond at, a, at some point. And your client is expecting the response within one minute. So if you send a request to the, that backend, and if you are waiting forever, 
to get the response, you won't be able to preserve the responsiveness to the, this client. So instead of that, what you can do is, without, retrying, without waiting forever, you can wait for some time. If you get the response, then you can send it to the client. If you are not getting the response on time, you can take some other action. Like you can send it to some other service or you may cancel it. So in that way, you can preserve the responsiveness to the client. So irrespective of what is happening in these backend services, the, the client will experience a responsiveness uh, without any issues. So in that case, we can prevent waiting forever and uh, preserve the responsiveness. Okay, so the next pattern is circuit breaker. Uh, I'm pretty sure everyone is aware of what is a circuit breaker. In electrical engineering, a circuit breaker is an automatically operated switch where it get uh, turned off when there's an excess current going on and it protect the circuit from getting uh, burned. Okay, so the same concept apply here in software as well. In software, circuit breaker is the uh, most popular resiliency pattern. So, so these, these the transient failures which we discussed uh, may take long time to respond. So if, if we retry so many attempts in a quick succession, so th there's a high chance of uh, they are getting failed and the backend service is also getting overloaded. Okay, so if you keep retrying, the backend services might get overloaded. So what we can do is, we can retry up to a certain level and then we can cut off the circuit at po some point. So the subsequent request we are getting from the client is getting dropped at the circuit breaker level. Okay, so in the circuit breaker, there are three states. So if everything is happening smoothly, the circuit will be in the closed state. Okay, so if, if nothing is failing, the circuit will be in the closed state. In, uh, uh, let's say a uh, one request get failed. So still the circuit will be in closed state until it reaches a certain threshold value. So until it reaches a certain threshold for failures, the circuit will be in the closed state. So the request will go through the circuit breaker. So once it is reached the threshold, the state will be moved to the open state. Okay. So when it is in open state, the all the requests coming into that circuit breaker is getting dropped at that level. So the circuit breaker will not try to send requests through that circuit breaker. So it is getting dropped. So the, the circuit will be in the open state for a while. So after that, time period expires, the state of the circuit will be moved to something called half open. So when it is at half open, the next request will go to the circuit breaker and it will send to the back end. Then if it is ended up with a success, the state of the circuit will be moved back to the closed state. If again that request fails, the circuit will be moved back to the open state. So those are the state in the circuit break. Okay. So, so what I already discussed was about general concept related to resiliency. So now let's look at how we can do resiliency with Ballerina. Okay. So as we know, Ballerina is uh, designed to uh, simplify the, the uh, programs with uh, network interactions. So since uh, we are targeting mainly about the network interactions, resiliency plays a key role. Uh, so we have built-in functionality to implement each of these resiliency patterns. So uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going, I'm going back to the story and see how we can implement different resiliency patterns in that story. Okay. So this is the... Uh, this uh, design which Bob came up with. So here you can see in the right hand side there are two legacy services, the account balance service and the account history service. Those are the 
uh, the legacy services already available in the bank and in front you have the mobile application. So in between those two we have the banking service. So banking service is the one uh, which we are going to implement using Ballerina. Okay. So here out of those two uh, uh, backend legacy services account balance service gives a lot of uh, issues. It has transient uh, network failures, sometimes it takes a long time to respond and it can only handle a moderate load. So the resiliency need to be implemented around that backend service. Um, so this is the backend service implemented in Ballerina. I'm not quite sure whether uh, people in the back can see this. So, so this is the, a simple service uh, named account and uh, it is exposed over HTTP protocol. So here uh, uh, we have the account balance resource which uh, accept uh, account balance requests and, and there's this uh, account balance legacy service represent as, a, as an endpoint in uh, Barina configuration. And also there's another service, another resource to uh, handle account history. And the, uh, the account history legacy service is represented using another endpoint. Okay, so this is a very straightforward and a simple Barina configuration. Uh, <coughs> So this is how it looks like in the design view of the composer. So here this is the resource and the vertical line in green color indicates an endpoint. So here uh, from the from uh, to the vertical line but to the vertical the green vertical line uh, we have a horizontal line going from the logic. So that represent an action performed against that particular endpoint. Okay. So this is the uh, representation of that uh, Barina service uh, in the design view. So let me uh, quickly uh, explain about some concepts related to this resiliency. So basically, uh, since we are dealing with some uh, uh, resiliency issues in uh, issues in the uh, uh, backend services. All these resiliency configuration need to be configured at the endpoint level. So let me describe those concepts. So we have something called connectors. A connector is something we can use to connect with some other system. So we have uh, server connectors and client connectors. So here we are connect, the ballerina is acting as a client and connecting <coughs> with some other systems. So, so we need a client connector for that. Here in this case, we have a HTTP client. Okay. So a connection means, a connection means an instance of a connection, connector. Okay. So that means the, uh, the connection has all the details to connect with the actual backend service. So here, this is the connector and the connector has connection parameters. So here the URL of the backend service is the connection parameters and optionally, uh, we can have option construct to. Uh, so the endpoint is something that we the ballerina programmer can work with. The endpoint is the actual representation of the backend service in Ballerina programming model. So the vertical line which we showed in the previous slide is a representation of an endpoint. Okay. So here in the connection, in the uh, connection you will get an option struct. So that is something we can use to fine tune the connection parameters. So I'll be discussing that more in the next slides. So let's see how we can handle transient failures. So transient failures with intermittent failures. So the first thing we can try applying the retry pattern. OK, 
Okay, so here you can see we have the application here sent a request, a message, and it is retried for two times. Okay, and so this is how we can configure Ballerina endpoint with retry configuration. So here, here we have the HTTP client, and within the HTTP client, using the option struct, we can define the retry config. So here you can see uh, we have set the retry count to 3 and with the duration of uh, 100 milliseconds. Okay, so th th this is a simple configuration you can do at the end, uh, end point level. So moving on to next, we can uh, configure timeouts. So, uh, the, in the timeout pattern, simply configured again using the option struct. So, here you can define the endpoint timeout uh, in within the struct. So, this endpoint uh, timeout is set to uh, 30 seconds here. Okay, so now let's see how we can uh, protect the backend services getting overloaded. Um, for that, we can apply the circuit breaker pattern. So unlike in previous two cases, pre in previous two cases we used uh, option struct to configure different uh, parameters like uh, timeout and the retry configuration. In here, the HTTP client is getting decorated, decorated with another connector called the circuit breaker. So we have the base connector as HTTP client and it is getting decorated this is the uh, base connector and it is de getting decorated with the circuit breaker connector. So likewise we can decorate the base connector in a chain. Okay, so here the, the decorated connector, the circuit breaker has its own option struct. So using its own option struct we can configure the retries before getting its suspension and the suspension duration. So these are these parameters belong to the circuit breaker. Okay. So next uh, let's see uh, we, we look at how we can apply different different uh, resiliency patterns at the endpoint level. Now let's see how we can apply all those together. Okay. So here here we have applied circuit breaker, retry and timeout all these patterns together. So in the outermost uh, connector you have the uh, circuit breaker and the circuit breaker has its uh, uh, own option struct to configure the uh, threshold values. And then uh, within the HTTP client connector you will get how, uh, the option struct with the uh, configuration for retry configuration and the endpoint uh, timeout configuration. So this is how we can configure uh, all these patterns together. Okay. Right. So uh, the next is uh, how we can do load balancing. So as I mentioned, the, this account balance service can handle only a moderate load. But fortunately, there are some uh, uh, instances, multiple instances of these account balance services. So Bob decided to uh, route the traffic in a random manner uh, using this Ballerina service uh, with different nodes. Okay, so this is how it looks like in the Ballerina configuration. Here we have another decorator connector called HTTP load balancer. Within the HTTP load balancer, you can have uh, one or more HTTP client. So basically the what HTTP load balancer connector does it load balancing between uh, whatever the child connectors it has uh, according to some uh, algorithm. Okay, so right now it is uh, only load uh, uh, round robin algorithm is supported. Okay, so uh, so as we know in a software project usually requirements get changed. So Bob got another requirement from the manager. So bank has. Uh, normal customers, regular customers as well as priority customers. So he was asked to provide a zero downtime service to these priority customers. 
okay to provide a zero downtimes to the priority customers so you need to have a really stable uh, service so fortunately bob found that out of the several nodes available in the system there's one particular service which is reliable kind of rea- reliable compared to the others so what he did was he decided to route all the traffic coming from uh, priority customers into that particular service and rest of the traffic is routed to the other nodes so here's how you can do it with ballerina i'm sure you can't see it uh, uh, people at the back can't see it so uh, let me explain what uh, he has done um uh, so to represent uh, the the back end service which got transient failures and the reliable service we have two different endpoint representation okay at the ballerina service level and so when the request come from the customer we need to detect whether uh, it is a request coming from the priority customers or it is a regular customer so to do that in ballerina we have a simple function based on the result of the function the traffic is routed to one of these backend services okay so it's just is nothing related to endpoint configuration but it's a simple ballerina logic which decide uh, the where to route the traffic so this is how you can achieve uh, different quality of services using a simple ballerina service um so here you can see the all these uh, resiliency stuff are configured at the endpoint level that is mainly because we are dealing with some backend service so uh, there are two ways you can configure this resilient stuff one is using this uh, option structs and the other one is writing some using some decorator connector so if we want to introduce a new one new resiliency pattern it's just a matter of uh, writing a new decorator connector and wrapping a base connector with it so in that way we can write more and more pa- resiliency patterns with ballerina so all all these uh, decorator connectors are written by the ballerina program in language itself okay so that's all i uh, plan to cover in this session so if you have questions i can take one or two i think i'm running late